I'll be talking to you about the milk and the animals and for the next 15 minutes I would try to find a link about how this milk and animal can be brought into a kind of a social context of delivering the social justice and social goods that all of us are trying to do. So you, you must have seen the small pellet in the uh, archives of the Mahenja Daro that for millions of years we remain attached to the animals for different reasons, right? For our uh, kind of emotionally we are attached to the animals, particularly in this country. And uh, also people looked at the animal as a companion. Now, if we take a quick look at the, what is the profile of these people who, who make this for us, the agriculture, this remains the major source of livelihood earning system, right? So whatever we do, if we go just one generation, two generation back, we find that our dada, dadis, nana, nanis, they were from some village and doing some good. Why they were doing so, this is, we are, we are discussing in today's context uh, that we are talking about the capability enhancement and all that. But somehow we were attuned to this kind of a living and on an average the 60% of the economically active population in this region of the Asia, uh, they are engaged in doing agriculture. In, in countries like Bhutan, this is as high as 92% of the people. There is over the last three, 30 years and uh, particularly I say there is massive investment in the agriculture where the agriculture is going mechanized and particularly when the area that I come from like Punjab and uh, Haryana you find that the bullocks are almost out, so it has been replaced by the tractors, and now people are talking about the air-conditioned tractors. It is good that the farmers are living good life. And uh, if you look, talk about our its net uh, contribution in the agriculture GDP, it is 40%. So what I wanted to say is that this agriculture indirectly, this drives the bound market of this. So in a, in a year where monsoon is good, you find industry is happy, why? because people have something to buy, their, their purchase power increases. So we are, uh, uh, in, in, a, in, in a sense, uh, I will not say indirectly, but very much directly involved with what is happening in the agricultural sector of this country. Next one. Coming to the white revolution, if you look at the India's figure, the blue bar, that indicates that what is the total number of the milk producing animals we have this in this country, and the green one that says that yes, how much of the total milk we produce in this country. So naturally India produces highest amount of the milk, say about 13-14%. We are ahead of the USA and many other countries. But it is also so that we have the highest population of the animals that are surviving in, the, in, in, in our country. And this huge population of the animals, directly or indirectly, they compete with you in terms of the three basic elements. That is the food, the shelter and the environment. Some of the food ingredients that we eat, they also eat. They need space, space to live, we also need a space to live. And when such a huge population of the animals live, it has its own environmental hazard. So in this particular picture, it is, it is very apparent to you. If for, for example, you look at USA, that they have what less animal and how much they produce. But very extreme example is probably New Zealand. If you look at it, they, they have I think very few number of animals, but they produce almost 3% of the total world's milk. And you will be surprised to know that 30% of this country's economy is being driven by the milk and the milk products. Next. So not only the livestock farming system in South Asia is influenced by the cultural context. We, have, we, 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 we keep animals more due to our obsession, our habit of living, but we have uh, the major milk producing animals in this country, they are also unique. Uh, I will quickly read that the majority of the livestock in Asia are kept by the small farmers. This is what we are habituated to see. Those of you who you have your roots in villages, you see small, small units of the animal herds having two animals, three animals, ten animals. Unlike when we go to Europe and America, we find the large herd. But coming to the who produces so much of the milk in our country? A animal called as the buffalo that, that, that comes immediately into the picture. They are very dear to us. Next one. So the buffaloes, they remain as the major contributor of our milk. These, if you, if you compare the cattle, the cow, vis-a-vis -vis the buffalo, the buffaloes, they are less than 50% of our total population, whereas they contribute as high as 60% of the total of 130 million tons of the milk that we produce in this country. These, uh, there are greater than 60% of the total world's buffalo population is here. 
and also in Pakistan. And the buffaloes can survive and produce oil under very less nutritional inputs. And they are resistant to many of the diseases. That is why their healthcare cost is less. And, but they have some problem in, in, in terms of their reproduction potential and all that. And I'll be talking about that very quickly. And also we are bestowed with a very huge and beautiful biodiversity in terms of the buffaloes having distinct breeds. For example, Mura, this is you find in the Bihar and Haryana and Punjab. Nagpuri you find in Maharashtra, Mehsana, Surti in Gujarat and Nili Rabi again in Punjab. Next one. So I try to look at our this particular asset and problem kind of thing under the three headings about how we manage this livestock and what is our production, the processing machinery that we use and what is the marketing and distribution uh, systems that are prevailing in this. And I also look at under three of these features that what are their unique characteristics and what are the challenges. The challenges, the unique features is of course, as I said, there are, there are huge number in population, about 370 million. The livestock farming complementary to the agriculture, buffaloes are the dairy animals of the choice for the farmers. The production and processing attributes you see, we have cyclic variation in terms of the availability of the milk. Sometimes it is glut in the market, the milk product, the milk prices go down, sometimes it is high in the market. The milk production varies from geographical to the country and majority of the processing is done at the unorganized sector. So there is some kind of a role for new entrepreneurs like you. So look at the challenges that I find is that the paucity of the superior germplasm. So our, we, have, we have more, that is why we produce more. Essentially this means what? This means that our animals are low producing. So somehow the biotechnology has to come in to improve the quality of these animals so that we can sustain this production with far lesser number of animals. We have difficulty in disseminating the technologies. When the herd size is small, when the units are small, you cannot afford to put into machines for doing that. So the cooperatives can probably help in doing that. The poor availability of low quality feed and fodder and the lack of classified physiological and genomic information, our DNA sequencing capability in this country is uh, growing up. I think it has to scale up many, many times more. And similarly, the bioinformatics capability and the poor health surveillance and the management. Coming to the milk processing sector, the animals are again low productivity. Our, our milk is poor in terms of the microbial content of it. That is why our milk is not doing so good when it comes to international market to compete with the milk from Netherlands or milk from Australia and milk for this. And you know one interesting story is that incidentally we live in a country which is being surrounded by the milk importers. If you look at the China, if you look at the Nepal, if you look at the Bhutan, look at the Pakistan, they are importing milk from countries like Australia and US and Netherlands and the New Zealand. But we are not able to grab this market due to the poor technology intervention that we are uh, worried about it. When it comes to the marketing, that is ultimately, the price of the milk has to go back to the farmer. So our, our whole marketing system is being uh, grabbed by the uh, middleman and that is why it is not going to the farmers. So we have to infuse some entrepreneurship into this. Next one. Yes, coming to this, I was talking about this. Out of this huge amount of the 140 million tons of the milk that we produce, you see, about almost 50% of the milk is retained at the village level, right? So they are being sold by households, this and that. 32% the processed is by the unorganized sector. The Cadbury and the Nestle and the Danan and the kind of uh, people like the, uh, there are many other multinationals, who are, they, they, they are now trying to enter into our market, they are doing better. And only 20% of this sector is being handled by the organized sector. Uh, we have a typical mindset and that we are habituated in drinking milk. We say, dood pita hua bacha. Is it? That, that as if that gives you a lot of strength and struggle. But have you recognized ever that when you take one glass of the milk, actually 80% of it is? Pardon? Water. You are being so satisfied drinking water um, in the name of the milk. So the value of the milk remains in its solid. And that is how you see how it is malhandled or mishandled or I say this is lack of our mindset or lack of our technological capability or maybe our purchase power is also low and the entrepreneurship, the, nobody has thought of how to convert this situation of uh, taking out the liquid milk of so much and convert this to some kind of useful market. For example, I see the ice cream market is still only 1%. If you say paneer, the 
so-called cottage cheese that we are fond of. It is 1%. Ice cream is 4%. Butter is 3%. We are very fond of uh, fat. I do not know why. But he stands at uh, 8%. And likewise. Next. So, uh, I, I give a case study that uh, there are several of the producer companies which are being coming up over there and that works on this pyramid that these producer companies work on feed and breed improvement, the disease control and the health management and the assured markets and the remunerative pricing. This has been proved to be useful. Uh, if, if I say, if I look at the impacts that the, through the operation flood, our per capita milk availability has increased by 127%. The milk production has increased from 17 million tons to, uh, I think, 130 million tons in 34 million tons in 2014. The dairy cooperatives have generated employment opportunities for approximately 15 million of the uh, uh, active population, and the dairy cooperative network that reaches uh, 1,29,000 village societies through so and so number of the milk unions. What they are doing socially, I will come to my next slide. If you look at the uh, cumulative, uh, the economic growth rate of this milk, this remains uh, very impressive of the 3.5 percent, uh, a, a, a very encouraging growth. But anyway, this, this lower picture that I was trying to show is that this still remains a concern that our par animal productivity that stands still low, we need to do something about this using biotechnology. Next. Coming back to the opportunities, what are the opportunities? The opportunities are that the livestock management sector, how we keep the animals, that can be improved by characterization of our, improved, of, of our own indigenous stock. Characterization means we have to hunt for the genes that they carry. There is no fun now in saying that this animal is black and this animal is yellow and this animal is white. It is time has come to know that what genes it carry and it have to propagate it. And then as a, as a typical character, this milk production ability of the animal this follows the bell curve like this. We have outstanding animals, that, but they are few in number. So we need technologies to multiply it. I'll show you how we are doing it over at NDRI. And we have to improve the nutrient quality, the diagnostics, and the better shelter management. Similarly, coming to the processing, the immediate priority is to produce clean milk because the business starts with the clean milk, having less of the microbial load. And we have to add value to this. At NDRI, certainly we have, uh, we have, we have started freezing the, 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 the milk because people are fond of uh, drinking Coca-Cola, not the milk. So can we really punch in the carbon dioxide in this and make it fizzy and make it a drink? Probably possible. We have done this. And the process standardization and the leveraging the economics of the sale of the indigenous milk products and the cold chain management. This is a very important issue. And coming to the marketing and then effective pricing of the milk, and eliminating the middleman. So I said the key enablers, who can enable, who can make it happen? Three things, one is biotechnology, then is entrepreneurship. A Lot of people, young educated people like you and me have to enter into this. Milk is not about dunks and urines, there is a lot of money involved in this and more importantly, the social service can be made delivered to a lot of people and certainly we need to have the engineering capability of handling such a huge amount of the milk. Next one. So going forward, I say the avenues for the biotechnology contribution, without going into the detail of it, I say the, our priorities are this. They are, first of all, we have to identify that who are the good animals. Then we have to develop something to faster multiply this. Then we have to have better feed. We have to have value added milk products and certainly management of the uh, animal health. Next one. This particular uh, calf was born uh, from a buffalo using a very unique technology called the IVF or the in vitro fertilization technology. Similarly, we have produced some cow and the buffalo breeds were very well attuned to our kind of the environment. And we have used the laboratory animals into practice to predict the fertility of the animals. And this is unique. You know, this, this animal is really prized animals. She produces about 50 liters of the milk a day, but she is unique. Not many such animals are available. So can we use something? We produce these 10 calves out of one animal in one year span, which otherwise would have taken 10 years. So whatever was possible in 10 years, we could make possible in one year using a technology called the embryo transfer technology. Next one. So these are in news, you must have uh, uh, listening about the NDRI, a lot of propaganda about the cloning story. So I, we have produced many more clones, but these animals are special. 
because uh, they have been produced without any father and they have been taken, the cells are taken from their mother and we have put it into a kind of egg cell to make them happen. And then see, these two bulls, they are produced from one embryo which has been split by a simple razor blade to make it two and then transferring it to the surrogate mothers to produce this. Some of these animals have been produced by the cells that are present in the urine when, the, when, when, when it, this is our waste product, but there are some somatic cells that are present in the urine. So if you can catch hold of the, this cell and put it to the egg and give proper environment, then that, that can be converted to a live calf. Next one. Next one. Yeah, these are some uh, milk products that we are uh, researching into this. For example, uh, people are uh, the probiotic, they're having the special bacteria in this, uh, the he or the yogurt. And under Operation Flood, we, we, we made a factory for pro making the vaccines for the animals. So that has turned out to be making now vaccines for the diphtheria and the hepatitis for the, for the human being. And also, if you look at when these ladies, as I said, most of these cooperatives, they're owned by the ladies. So when they assemble together, they have their own microfinance banks and they have their own literacy programs. Next one. This is not certainly the way of drinking milk, right? So if this audience can at least take home this message that uh, the milk, unpasteurized milk, it has lots of microbes that can make you sick. And when you become sick, you make another 10% sick in your society. And secondly, let this milk be touched by the industry. This milk is having a lot of good things. It is standardized. You have fat, the amount that you need. You have protein, the amount of this. Milk is deficient in iron, you know. So it has iron added to this and so on and so forth. And thank you very much for this opportunity. <laughs>